Well, welcome everybody as we come to this third session of the Consecration of St. Joseph. I'm Deacon Ken Severinsen. For those that don't know me officially, and uh, we got a full house here for those joining us uh, live, we've got probably about 500 in the audience today, so it might get a little bit loud. So, if we pick up our song, Oh Blessed St. Joseph, and we'll begin with that. Oh, blessed St. Joseph, how great was thy worth, the one chosen shadow of God upon her, foster father of Jesus, all oh, then wilt thou be, sweet spouse of Our Lady, our Father to me. For thou to the pilgrim our Father and God, and Jesus and Mary felt safe by thy side. O oh, blessed Saint Joseph, how sweet I should be, sweet spouse of Our Lady, a Father to me. Please join me on page 247, and as we pray, come Holy Spirit. Um, and remember that we are in Lent, so we can't say that A word. So We can say Amen, but not that other A word. Let us begin as we begin all good things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together. Come, Holy Spirit, send down those beams which sweetly flow in silent streams from thy bright throne above. O come, thou Father of the poor, O come, thy source of all our store, come, fill our hearts with love, O thou of comforters the best, O thou the soul's delightful guest, the pilgrim's sweet relief. Rest art thou in our toil, most sweet, refreshment in the noonday heat, and solace in our grief. O blessed light of life, true thou, and fill of light in thy most heart, and those who hope in thee, without thy Godhead, none akin, and any price or worth in man, nothing can harmless be. Lord, wash our sinful stains away, Refresh the heaven, our bread and day, our wounds and bruises heal. To thy sweet yoke, our stiff necks bow. Warm with thy fire, our hearts of snow, our wandering feet recall. Grant to thy faithful, dearest Lord, whose only hope in thy sure word, the sevenfold gifts of grace, Grant us in life thy grace that we in peace may die and ever be. In joy before thy face. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, first of all, um, I want to thank Father Wilhelm and Father Worth for the last two sessions and bringing that bar up so high that's giving me a nervous breakdown so <laughs> thank you guys this is the second time for me going through this book when the pandemic started this book was out and my wife and I decided that we would do this consecration by ourselves and I was I'm going to be honest with you I, I was on fire with it and I wanted to teach on it and I really wanted to share this with the parish. Going through it a second time, I don't have that fire like I did before. There's not a newness in it for me. And so I've been praying with it now a little more than just going through it and having it anew. So I think I'm getting something deeper out of it this time, and that flame is still there, but not like it was when I first read it. And there's some things in this book that we have never heard about. 
And yet, maybe as Catholics, we should have. What I kept coming across, and it kept coming to me, a filial relationship, spelled F-I-L-I-A-L, filial relationship. And I thought about the four words that the Greeks use when they speak about love. And when we're reading something, we're, re we're reading a love story, we're reading something that, or, or visiting with somebody, and how they speak about love, we kind of know what those are. And maybe I'll pronounce them a little different here. Agape, eros, philia, and storge. Well, the Greeks, when we talk about agape, that's that love we have for God, that higher love. That eros is what we have for our spouse. Philia is like friendship. The friends that we carry. And storge, just like the stork, it's our children. That old story of where the baby come from. And that's how I remember it. So um, try to keep it simple. But in this book, it, it doesn't use those four types of languages. It uses filial relationship. And it's interesting how this kind of stood out to me now after Father Worth gave us the genealogy of St. Joseph. Filial is designating the generation or the sequence of generations. I didn't know truly what it meant and what they were looking at. So Father Worth really laid the foundation last week, knowing it or not, that the filial relationship between this couple is going back generations and generations and generations. It's somebody that's dutiful, devoted, loyal, faithful, respectful, dedicated, affectionate, loving, befitting a son or a daughter. It's about family. All of these are great attributes that we would hope to have in our own families let alone into the Holy Family. Isn't that beautiful? Just this filial relationship. And I went back, and every time they talked about it, the word love was in the sentence. So it caught my attention. There's so much <clears throat> in this week that I know we're not going to touch on everything. And it might seem like I'm going to jump around a little bit and kind of jab and take a little bit of this. And maybe there's some things I should spend a little bit more time on, and I'm not. I know you guys have all read the book. and what I'm just going to point some things out. We learn that patriarch means father. And after Christ, St. Joseph is the greatest of all patriarchs. He's the greatest of all fathers. St. Joseph is a model for foster fathers, putative fathers, legal fathers, spiritual fathers, and virgin fathers. I did not know what putative father was. Maybe you guys do. The definition is a man whose legal relationship to a child has not yet been established, but who is alleged to be or claims to be the biological father of a child who is born to a woman to whom he is not married at the time of the child's birth. Isn't that what we're seeing in the world today? Aren't we seeing a lot of these putative fathers that I didn't even know what they were, had a category for them? Other thing that caught my mind was a virgin father. When we think of fathers, it's our natural instinct to think the marital act has happened. There is, even today, virgin fathers. Fathers who have married in to another 
with a lady that has had children. Her spouse has passed, and he can still be a virgin. We don't think of these things too often like that, do we? These are just some of the things that touch on who St. Joseph is, and yet how do they relate to us today? There's a quote on page 108 from Venerable Pope Pius XII that says, If you wish to be close to Christ, we can again today repeat, go to Jesus. Go to Joseph. When I was in formation, I wanted an answer to my question. And the teacher said, have you talked to Jesus? And about the third time of me asking that, I got a question, have you talked to Jesus? That's what I kept going back to on this. I don't think I ever went to Joseph, especially being a father myself. We always turn to the the Trinity, and we have Joseph here, our patron saint of our parish. I'll be honest, I felt a little guilty about that. And it's natural that we would. Sometimes we take things for granted. What we had yesterday is gone. What we have today is here. And we take for granted these little things. I think in our parish, we've taken St. Joseph for granted. So when I was thinking about this, go to Joseph, I was thinking about the two Josephs right off the top of my head in the Bible. And it took me back to religious ed. Not mine, because that's too far gone. But when I was teaching religious ed, a lot of students would ask, as we were going through, it's kind of like a Bible timeline. I always like to do the history of things to get them right up to where they are. And they'd ask, is Joseph in the Old Testament that same Joseph who was married to Mary? And I think there's a lot of people that kind of still wonder that today, even not just children. And and just on a side note, if I didn't know the answer, I never gave them something from the hip. I always said, I'll I'll get it and I'll come back to you next week. And uh, it normally came out when I came back with the answer. It was the parents that wanted to know. And they were telling, ask ask the teacher what, you know, the parents were always kind of telling the kids what, what questions. And I see that there's some of you that are in here today that have been teaching religious ed for many years, and you've probably heard some of these things. But in the book of Genesis, Joseph, the son of Israel, was sold into slavery by his brothers and taken to Egypt, where Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, adopted Joseph into his own family and was given great authority. He was placed in charge of all the granaries in Egypt, and Egypt was considered at at that time the breadbasket of the world. So when others had a shortage of food, Pharaoh instructed them to go to Joseph. Now, we all know the rest of the story and how Joseph's family members who sold him needed bread to eat. And they had to go to Joseph, their brother, for the food. And he treated them with kindness and mercy. Thanks to Joseph and his role as the keeper of the grain, countless lives were saved from famine and death. The prefiguration of a much greater Joseph who would bring his son, the bread of heaven, to safety in Egypt. There's a correlation here. 
Sometimes I can see where people would get it mixed up if they don't know the timelines. St. Joseph, our spiritual father, is much greater than Joseph of the Old Testament. St. Joseph was the keeper of the bread from heaven. Without St. Joseph, we would not have the living bread of the Eucharist. Think about the souls today that receive that precious bread that St. Joseph took into for, to Egypt for his safety. Switch gears a little bit. There's something that I kind of chuckled about in the in the book, and it comes from Fulton Sheen. And uh, it's interesting is that the last few days, people have been talking about this book, and they've been um, telling me all about it, and asking me what my opinion was, and. Um, and uh, what, what do you think about Joseph as this young man? And, uh, I, you know, I've never really thought about it. Truth, truthfully, I think he looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but we know what Fulton Sheen says, and I wanted to read it. Joseph was probably a young man, strong, viral, athletic, handsome, chaste, and disciplined. Instead of being a man incapable of loving, he must have been on fire with love, just as we would give very little credit to the Blessed Mother if she had taken her vow of virginity after having been an old maid for 50 years. So neither could we give much credit to a Joseph who became her spouse because he was advanced in years. Young girls in the days, like Mary, took vows to love God uniquely, and so did young men, of whom Joseph was one so prominent as to be called the just. Instead then of being dried fruit to be served on the table of the king, he was rather a blossom filled with promise and power. He was not in the evening of life, but in its morning, bubbling over with energy, strength, and controlled passion, Mary and Joseph brought to their apostles not only their vows of virginity, but also two hearts with greater torrents of love than had ever before cursed or coursed through human breasts. How much more beautiful Mary and Joseph became when we see in their lives what might be called the first divine romance. No human heart is moved by love of the old for the young, but who is not moved by the love of the young for the young. In both Mary and Joseph, there were youth, beauty, and promise. God loves cascading cataracts and bellowing waterfalls, but he loves them better, not when they overflow and drown his flowers, but when they are harnessed and bridled to light a city and to slake the thirst of a child. In Joseph and Mary, we do not find one controlled waterfall and one dried up lake, but rather two youths, who before they knew the beauty of the one and the handsome strength of the other, willed to suffer these things for Jesus. Leaning over the manger crib of the infant Jesus, then and not age and youth, but youth and youth, the consecration of beauty is in a maid in the surrender of the strong comeliness in a man. This is the type of love story that I kind of started out talking about in that, that filial relationship. And it goes on to say that some of our 
thoughts about Jesus or G, uh, Joseph is that he was about 91 years old. And that the fathers thought that they were protecting the virginity of Mary by casting him as an old man. And some of this comes from our non-canonical documents. And as you read on, it goes on to say, no wonder a few people have paid attention to St. Joseph over the centuries, thinking that he was old. But if he was this young man that Fulton Sheen just talked about, would he have drawn more attention? And would it have drawn more attention to the virginity of Mary in a negative way? And this is where I kind of chuckled. Now don't take this the wrong way, it says. The Lord loves elderly men. <laughs> Thank you. Most of you know I just retired in January. And as I still feel young. I don't feel like um <clears throat> and Saint <laughs> I'm not ninety one. Okay, so but it says Saint Joseph was the loving husband of Mary, not a retired husband incapable of manual labor and long journeys on foot. I think they're putting me out to pasture here. <laughs> Something else I had to underline. Afternoon naps and forgetfulness. <laughs> Again, there's nothing wrong with old age. What the church and the world can learn from a younger depiction of St. Joseph, especially in theology, preaching, literature, and art, is that young men can be chaste, heroic, and holy. Age has nothing to do with our spiritual maturity, does it? I don't know. For me personally, if I need to see Joseph as a young man or as an old man, but I think I need to look at him as the prime example of maybe of where the bar has been set and we need to get to it. We talk a little bit about virtues and vices. And we both, and we pass on these both to our children. I really struggled with this. Before I was ordained a deacon, I took some time to pray on what I passed on. And when I started, and it's like God really opened that up to show me what I had passed on. And those vices that I passed on to my children today, they still hurt. Um, maybe that since I'm not an old man yet, I have plenty of time to change some of those things. But that's been set already. There's already some things there. So living this virtues and these vices in our lives and what we pass on, it's kind of interesting how we never think about those. It was in Father Wilhelm's homily a couple weeks ago that he talked about St. Jerome wanting to give everything to Jesus. And he gave him his love and his possessions but Jesus wanted more. He wanted his sins and his troubles and his suffering. I think we need to focus on some of those things, especially during this Lenten time that will take us into a deeper relationship, not only with Jesus, but with St. Joseph. Now, we all know that St. Joseph was a virtuous man. What vice do you think that he passed on to his son? <laughs> Nobody's going to guess. As a carpenter, I am thinking he would have had a clamp for wood. That's a type of vice for woodworking. 
do you think he passed on his vice? <laughs> this is how God works in me. Okay. <laughs> so, but wouldn't that be great if we could take our children out to the shop and guarantee to them that this will be the only vice that we pass on to them as we hand over our tool. Now you got that picture in your mind, don't you? But seriously, let's go back to a virtue for a moment. Chastity is a virtue and all people are called to chastity. Chastity is the virtue that prevents us from being slaves to our passion. St. Joseph was not only a chaste man, but a celibate one too. He was called by God to espouse Mary. St. Joseph and Mary lived in what is often called a Josephite marriage. They were truly husband and wife, but they never engaged in sexual relations. Their vocation was to be united in heart, mind, and soul, never in body. In St. Joseph, God prepared a spouse, a guardian, and a night for Mary. According to God's design, it had to be this way. God did not come into the world in any other manner than through the marriage of a man and a woman, a virginal man and woman. St. Joseph, Mary experienced a perfect reflection and mirror of God's love for her. When Mary met St. Joseph, she knew that God had chosen him to be her loving and beloved husband. Trusting in God's plan, she fell in love with St. Joseph and gave him her heart. Mary's body was reserved for God but she still had the freedom to give her heart to St. Joseph, the only man worthy of her, the only man perfectly reflecting the pure love of God. Isn't that a great love story? Say that to a group of men that we're going to read a love story today. I'm glad they shut the doors. <laughs> Have you ever thought how God prepared these two for marriage? Today, we ask engaged couples to start their marriage preparation at least six months before their wedding day. And we currently use a program called FOCUS for our marriage ministries. FOCUS is facilitating open couples communicating, understanding, and study started in 1985, this program, and it was intended for the Diocese of Omaha. And today it is all over the world and they are struggling on how to produce it in more languages. Amazing, isn't it? Every one of us here can remember 1985. Marriage preparation has been seen and put into practice as a gradual and continuous process. It includes three main stages. They're called remote, proximate, and immediate preparation. Remote preparation is the period of our childhood years. Yes, we are all being prepared for marriage in the early years of our lives. And we are being formed as young children. Proximate preparation is that period when we are young adults being formed on how to have stable work, financial, housekeeping, a preparation for life as a couple. And immediate preparation is the engaged couple as they are months and weeks away from their sacrament of marriage.
Priests are formed for eight years. Deacons are formed for five. What we're focusing on today is if you want to be married, just come six months prior. And you know what they've already gotten as young children and adults in their life. What are we saying about marriage today? Is it important or not? Research, research has shown that 74% of Catholics say it's acceptable for an unmarried couple to live together even if they don't plan to get married. That number is huge, isn't it? Seventy-six percent of U.S. Catholics say homosexuality homosexuality should be accepted. The average age is out to thirty-three years old, and only twenty-seven percent believe it's a vocation. And fifty-six percent believe that marriage is whatever two people want it to be. This makes me sad. Can you see the issues we are facing? And think about the generations that will be affected to come. Remember the genealogy that was given to us last week? And what filial relationship is? The sequence of generations. Unfortunately, those who work with engaged couples today are only with the couples in the immediate stage. I don't know about you, but I can surely see a clear path that God was preparing St. Joseph for Mary and for a lasting holy marriage and the path that we are on today. We should all be striving for holy marriages. We hear about this Feast of the Holy Spouses this past week as we're reading. Wouldn't it be great to be present at that wedding of Mary and Joseph? I know that you've read about um, the mystic that was there when they said their vows. With Mary and Joseph as the prime example of how to live a holy marriage, I was thinking that we are all called to live as holy spouses, and we should be celebrating this with great joy. And not just taking our wives out to eat on our anniversaries and letting them supersize it. I know that some of you know what that means. There's a certain restaurant that used to have that. Like it has an M. (laughs) You see the importance of the genealogy, the preparation of what God did for Mary and Joseph. What we as parents need to do for our children and our grandchildren and to be those examples. I wish I would have had this book a long time ago to follow St. Joseph's example a little bit closer. I recently shared this with uh, it was the St. Vincent de Paul group. In 2005, this thing goes in and out. In 2005, I was asked by the company that I worked for if I would um, go to um, Minnesota and start managing the, comp- the company from that side. And I managed the North Dakota plants, and they wanted me to take over both. I couldn't leave 
St. Joseph's Parish. This is, this is the honest truth. I prayed in the church many times. I prayed in my pickup when I was driving. I even went out into the back woods behind where we lived, out at the lake, and I would pray out there. My wife and I prayed, and I was not being called to move from this community. I knew that God didn't want to take me out of this parish, out of St. Joseph's Parish. I couldn't explain it, but I knew that's what it was. And I used an example uh, to my bosses at that time that my wife was getting a new kitchen and they were finishing it that day. And that was the truth, that they were finishing her kitchen, and she wanted this new kitchen for 11 years, so it probably wasn't going to really work. I was using my wife as an excuse to stay here. And then over the next few years, um, you know, everything worked out, and I was able to manage both locations, but still stay here. And then I was called to the diaconate, ordained, and assigned here. I didn't want to leave St. Joseph's perish period however god works in our lives that's what he was keeping me here when i retired january 14th went to adoration at 11 p.m that night that was my last day of work for the company and i went into the church because there was two people already in the adoration chapel and I turned a couple lights on in the church and I went and I prayed and I, as soon as my knees hit the kneeler, I felt God saying to me, welcome home. And looking back on that, I think that was Jesus speaking to me through St. Joseph because I didn't want to leave this parish. I didn't know what St. Joseph meant to me. as we kind of move into a little different direction. And I brought up Jesus a few times. St. Joseph is called the Savior of the Savior because he saved Jesus from the wicked intentions of Herod and by taking Jesus to Egypt. St. Joseph is the only saint who has the privilege of being called the Savior of the Savior. Not even the Mother of God has such a title. St. Alphonsus Liguria, the doctor of the church, went so far as to claim that because St. Joseph saved the Savior from Herod, Jesus will not refuse anything to those who go to St. Joseph for assistance. I prayed in our parish of St. Joseph for what the company needed and what I needed. And I know that St. Joseph was a part of that. Ultimately, St. Joseph saved Jesus' life so that Jesus could save us at the foot of the cross. Mary remembered how St. Joseph, as head of the family, had taken her and Jesus to Egypt and how strong St. Joseph had been in protecting and caring for their family. Walking to Egypt could not have been safe or comfortable for the Holy Family. Jesus, too, would have had St. Joseph on his mind and in his heart at Calvary. The virginal hearts of Mary and Jesus and St. Joseph are one. As their hearts are one, so is their mission. Jesus alone is the Savior of the world. But he wanted his mother and father to have a unique participation in the work of redemption. A father's work is never finished and his children are safely home. In heaven, St. Joseph is no longer needed to watch over and protect Jesus. But we, however, are not in heaven. 
St. Joseph will never abandon us. Our role is to entrust ourselves to a diligent care and never look back. I just had a thought. On those days that I prayed and I wanted to stay in this parish, I know that in my heart, St. Joseph had, a, had a, a big part of that to hold me here. And there's a book that I was given in my last days of formation by Deacon uh, James Keating, and it's called Discerning the Heart of the Diaconate. And I read that book And it just burned me. Deacon Cading said in that book, the only reason you're being called to the diaconate is because you're never going to be saved. And I thought, what? But thinking about that, I took that on my silent retreat, my five-day canonical retreat, and I prayed on that book. And what Deacon Keating was saying is that I wasn't willing to change. I wasn't willing to do what God was calling me to do. And he was right. And this all started in this process, on this journey to holy orders, was praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament and St. Joseph in our own parish. The only person that really knows um, that I ever shared this with was my wife. And I said, I was very angry at that time of my life that they put me in such a position that I had to make a choice. God was working in the company I was working for. He was working in the people that I worked for. I can guarantee you if I never prayed to St. Joseph, I wouldn't be here today. And I don't think I'd be one of the 500 sitting here either. (laughs) Our role is to entrust ourselves to his diligent care and never look back. As we look forward into day 15, On page 41. Today calling a man the head of the family is frowned upon. God is not worthy but political correctness, however. God is not worried about political correctness, however. He established the family and designated that fathers be the head of their families. Now, this doesn't mean that men are better than women. The greatest human person who ever lived was not a man, but a woman. Mary, the mother of God. Jesus is a divine person. Jesus and Mary both delighted in the headship of St. Joseph in their home. Why are many people offended by such terminology today? Sadly, it often stems from having been emotionally, physical, and sexual abuse by a father figure. Such abuse breaks the heart of God. Yet the crisis in manhood can be corrected if men begin to imitate St. Joseph. His fatherly example shows that strength, authority, and headship are meant to be at the service of others. In Joseph, heads of the household are blessed with the unsurpassed model of fatherly watchfulness and care. 
says Pope Leo XIII. Husband and fathers need to imitate St. Joseph. Families around the world will experience a revolution of holiness if husbands imitate St. Joseph. Important passages in the New Testament will no longer be seen as offensive, but life-giving. Be subordinate to one another out of the reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of the church, he himself the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, so also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. In any case, each one of you should love his wife as himself, and the wife should respect her husband. From Ephesians 5, 22 to 23, or 33. Make St. Joseph the spiritual head of your family. Obtain a statue or a beautiful image of St. Joseph for your home. Place it in a prominent location and frequently invoke the intercession of St. Joseph as a family. You will see the difference St. Joseph makes. Dear brothers and sisters, the sacrament which unites you to each other unites you in Christ. It unites you with Christ. This mystery is a profound one from Ephesians 5.32. He comes to you and is present in your midst and dwells in your souls, in your families, in your homes. St. Joseph was well aware of this. For this reason, he did not hesitate to entrust himself and his holy family to God. By virtue of this trust, he completely fulfilled his mission, entrusted to him by God for the sake of Mary and his son. Support it's supported by the example and protection of St. Joseph, offer a constant witness of devotion and generosity from St. John Paul II. On page 180, we have the Holy House of Loreto. And I'm going to let you guys read that on your own. And it's something that I think you uh, would probably like to experience on your own um, the first time I read that, I was just in awe, and I read, I've read it two, three times uh, again, and um, it was something I, I never knew about. I've been to Italy, I've never been to Loreto, so I kind of like to maybe go back if somebody wants to start a trip someday, and we'll, maybe we can all do this together as a parish. As I reread it again today, I was getting a little bit more lighthearted on it, and uh, if you're not familiar with it, I don't want—I don't want to ruin the story of how this happened. But the Holy House has been moved a few times, and I started to think about living here in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, with the lake flooding, and living on the lake myself. Well, I too had a house that was moved twice. But I don't think it was the holy hell then, so. <laughs> I think we had a, a, a different way of looking at the, as the lake was flooding here. So um, enjoy that story. 
enjoy that new knowledge of that holy house of Loreto. As we come to an end, let's pray as one community the prayer of the Litany of St. Joseph on page 233. The Litany of St. Joseph. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. God, the Father of heaven. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world. God, the Holy Spirit. Holy Trinity, one God. Holy Mary. St. Joseph. Noble offspring of David, light of patriarchs, spouse of the mother of God, chaste guardian of the virgin, foster father of the son of God, zealous defender of Christ, head of the holy family, Joseph most just, Joseph most chaste, Joseph most prudent, Joseph, most courageous. Joseph, most obedient. Joseph, most faithful. Mirror of patience. Lover of poverty. Model of workmen. Glory of domestic life. Guardian of virgins. Pillar of families. Comfort of the afflicted. Hope of the sick. Patron of the dying, terror of demons, protector of the Holy Church, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, He has made Him Lord of His household. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, Today we've talked a little bit about virtues and vices and I think you're going to like take a little bit more better look at vices and pass on those vices in your life that you can, your children can use to build and create and not to tear down. We learned a little bit about marriages in this world today and where we are. The path that was prepared for St. Joseph and Mary, and we ask that each of us take a little bit of time in our own little stories, in our own little places in this world, and how we can connect to St. Joseph in a deeper way. Thoughts, questions? There's over 500 people, and we have one guy with his hand up. So the question is, after 14 days of this uh, book so far, and the wondering why Joseph was taken before the crucifixion, that's a good question. We'll have to. I've always wondered that. I just, you know, I'm sure there's a reason for it, but I just. 
Well, I'm only a deacon, and so I only have five years of formation. <laughs> the priest has eight. <laughs> but there, this is a great mystery uh, in the church. Um, we can have speculation on things. We can come up with our own conclusions. Um, more than likely, we're, we're probably wrong. Uh, but it's a, it's, a gr- it's a great question, and I'm not going to give you an answer on it. Um, go to Joseph and ask him. <laughs> go to Joseph and see what he tells you. And then let us know. <laughs> okay? Any other questions? Anybody know how to play piano? <laughs> we can. We will sing it without. Third verse, same as the first. <laughs> you want to lead? Safekeeping was found for them both in thy word. O Father of Jesus, be Father to me. Sweet spouse of Our Lady, I will love thee. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thanks.